I'm Henry Kaufman, and the question that has been raised by this panel, is it time to break up the big banks? And I will answer that question very quickly, and I would say yes. Um, and that, of course, concludes the session. Uh, uh, now, I, I have reached that conclusion for some time, as some of you may know or may not know, but I strongly believe that as a result of the events that have transpired and are transpiring, there is a major transformation in our financial markets today, a high concentration of assets in the small number of financial institutions, which of course is going to be detailed by Loretta in greater details. And as a result, our large institutions are in the process of becoming financial public utilities. And much of the allocation of credit, that process will be socialized over time. We're well on the way. The Dodd-Frank legislation has just accelerated the process. There is an overlay, an overlay of financial regulations coming on stream here, far beyond anything that anyone would have comprehended, to sanctify, to a large extent, too big to fail. Uh, competition is going to be diminished. Now, we got there in a number of ways. Uh, uh, there was, as some have indicated this morning, inadequate supervision by the author official authorities. And particularly, I think, there were many shortcomings in monetary policy in the last 20, 30 years. In particular, the great failure of the central bank to recognize the structural changes that we're taking in our financial markets, the new instruments, the new institutions, and the impact that all of this would have on economic and financial behavior. Now, that doesn't mean that the institutions involved shouldn't be blamed. The management there has had a responsibility. But having said this, I would say to you, again, my conclusion is inst big institutions should be allowed to fail. It is time to break them up. If not, I will tell you what I believe the consequences are going to be as we head along this road of financial consolidation. First of all, the high concentration of assets raises the troubling question from my mind about the role of the Federal Reserve and whether it will really be able to conduct monetary policy. When monetary policy restrains, who's going to be affected if there are these big financial institutions deemed too large to fail? It, remain, it, re it leaves, therefore, pressure on the remaining institutions that are allowed to fail. And when they do fail, where will they land up? They will be consolidated into the rest of the structure. Secondly, a financial conglomerates, as they continue to grow, there's a conflict of interest that is unavoidable. All of these firms operate on both sides of the market. As portfolio managers and institutional investors on the buy side, as underwriters and dealers on the sell side, and as financial advisors on both sides. Next, I think the tradable securities market, the spread between the bid and the ask price in those markets will widen, reducing the market power of the few remaining market makers. Now, I'm probably the oldest one here, but if when I look back 30, 40 years ago, there were so many independent financial institutions just in New York, so many independent commercial banks in the city of New York. Ask yourself, who is left? And what command will these, those remaining institutions have over bid and ask pricing in the marketplace? Next, the volatility and the value of securities will increase with growing financial concentration. As number of market makers dwindle, the depth of secondary markets will decrease as well. Also, 
financial concentration will reduce the ready access to financing by small business. Large institutions, has been shown, are not geared to be ready and flexible lenders to small business organizations. And I think this is, among other things, that their lending and investing policies tend to be centralized rather than decentralized. And that their local managers, they don't aspire really to a lifetime of service to the community in which they are assigned. Most aspire to move up in the management ladder and in the structure of the financial conglomerate. Next, I would argue that financial concentration will increase the flow of money to large business corporations and enhance, therefore, industry concentration here and abroad. Financial concentration doesn't necessarily support the role of the U.S. as the center of the financial markets of the world. It wasn't too many years ago one prevailing view that was held is that we must allow financial institutions in the United States to consolidate, to become larger, in order to compete with institutions in Europe and Japan and elsewhere. Now ask yourself, what has happened to those competitors elsewhere <coughs> in Europe, as well as even in Japan? Have they done that well? Have they performed that well? Those institutions are already, to a large extent, they're all too big to fail, and they have become, to some extent, financial public utilities. Now, I would say to you that it's very, we can avoid, perhaps, these negative consequences, but only with a lot of strong political will. And here, I would like to point out to you that there wasn't any strong political will on both sides of the aisle. The Dodd-Frank legislation appealed to both. It is so big, 500,000 words. Now, the Constitution of the United States is between 10 and 15,000 words. The Declaration of Independence, 7,000 words. This document is over 500,000 words and getting bigger. And the whole details haven't been worked out. They're being worked out and compromised and so on. What are we going to have? An enormous bureaucracy in place overseeing the financial structure of the United States and therefore a very big hand in the allocation of credit, which at one time was much more in the purview of the system itself, the institutions, the marketplace, and so on. We are not headed in that direction. And there is no debate politically anymore to regear and say big institutions are too, should, not be, should be allowed to fail. And someone will say, well, but how are we going to handle this? We should change the legislative process. Remember, in the 1930s, the Glass-Steagall Act came into being under great duress. It served us reasonably well for quite a while until it was chipped away at and forgotten. The Federal Reserve made no analysis of the consequences of the departure of the Glass-Steagall Act. No federal greatest credit agency, no federal institution at all, no political body came forth and said, now we don't have Glass-Steagall anymore. What do we have? More financial uh, concentration. And what are its consequences? That we are moving towards financial public utilities. Quite different from the structure that we had in the American society throughout its history. Now with that, I'm going to step down and let everybody else clarify uh, what I said. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, um, uh, our, our first real speaker is Ira Milstein, the venerable Ira Milstein, uh, whom you know all about, and I'm delighted to be on the program with Ira. Ira? Well, Henry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak sitting down because I'm older than you are, believe it or not. <laughs> 
<laughs> Anyhow, here's uh, my position on this. I'm not going to advocate breaking up the banks <clears throat> and such uh, because I don't know what we're talking about. I don't think those words have any substantive content. Having said that, I agree with you. And uh, the question, <laughs> having said that, I think we need to begin to think about, all right, how are we going to go about dealing with this problem, which is a heavily concentrated industry? Uh, I'm an antitrust lawyer. I've been practicing uh, antitrust law since 1949, in and out of the government. I only got into corporate governance by mistake, and I'm here. But nevertheless, this is taking me back to my roots. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, this is really very peculiar. It's a weird industry that we have here. I, I started making notes on what people talked about this morning, and everybody had a very good idea, but nobody talked about how to implement them. For example, Mr. Carey, and I think you're right, talked about we have to start thinking about the industry, or do we have to start thinking about the industry based on the current structure? He went on to think about the industry and the current structure. I would like to think about the industry not in its current structure. I would like to think about what the nature of the system is. Just as he said, shouldn't we rethink the nature of the system? And maybe we have to change, as he put it, the intellectual foundations of the system. I agree with that completely. Because what I think is happening is that we aren't thinking out of the box. Regulators are thinking about more regulation. Nobody's thinking about how to get rid of more regulation and what to do about it. What we're doing is we're perpetually piling on regulations on top of regulations just to try to mimic the private sector and the marketplace. That's all we're doing. And we can't. We will never, by regulation, be able to mimic market discipline. It doesn't work that way. So what I'm urging you all to do is to begin to think about what do we have to do to think about the structure of this industry uh, and what might be done to see that it, with proper less regulation, we might be able to restore some form of market discipline on what's going on. Charles had a little. There are tidbits here and there. I'm suggesting that we think about how to do it really, really from the beginning. And as, let's do it as I was as an antitrust lawyer. I think we have to think about it in terms of regulation and antitrust. And when I talk about antitrust, I don't mean antitrust in a mi micro sense. I mean in a macro sense. Competition. Can we restore a marketplace in this industry? The first thing we have to do is stop thinking about these people as banks. They're not banks. They're not the people you go and take money out of or put money into on the corner. They are huge financial conglomerates. They're different. They are not like we used to think of banks. And we keep on talking about breaking up the banks. That isn't what needs to be done. We have to think about the structure of this industry being composed of conglomerates of many, many products doing many different things in many different markets. And is that a good thing for the world? Not sure. And why I'm not sure is because it's heavily concentrated, as Henry said. Now, why antitrust? Because I think vigorous competition in the banking sector can play a really important role in reducing moral hazards. I think the antitrust laws have been our charter of economic freedom from 1890 on, and I don't know why it can't work in the banking industry, at least to a degree. I think antitrust would reduce systemic risk and the too-big-to-fail problem. Now, are we hamstrung? No. Dodd-Frank recognizes that it did not outlaw the antitrust laws. There is a provision in Dodd-Frank that says nothing in the act uh, shall be construed to modify, impair, or supersede the operation of the antitrust laws. They said that, but they didn't do anything about it. They just said it's there. So it's there for us to use if we want to. Moreover, the Supreme Court has expressly said that the Bank Merger Act doesn't stop the application of the antitrust laws. They will be applied to banks where appropriate. So we have an open door to go through to look at what we have, namely high concentration, high conglomeration, a lack of competition, and what to do about it, and how to apply antitrust principles. Now, I want to start immediately by saying I don't believe for a minute we can create utopia. What do I consider to be utopia? Utopia was what we had between 1994 and 99, before the repeal of Glass-Steagall and after the enactment of Regal-Neal. Uh, uh, it seemed to me 
We had five of six years of close to utopia. Could we repeat that? Uh, well, this is what we would have. We have an FDIC, which uh, stood behind bank deposits. We'd have Glass-Siegel, which divided investment banking and banking. We'd have consumer protection in a big way by having laws which ensure disclosure on the issuance of securities and credits, the SEC, uh, truth in lending, electronic funds transfer, it was all there. Uh, the continued allowance of interstate banking, that should be. And then the vigorous application of the antitrust laws to ensure competition. That would be utopia, be a simple world. Uh, that, erase that, it'll never happen. We can't go back to that utopia. So what we have to think about is what did we do? What we did was we substituted for all of that Dodd-Frank and an abundance of regulation. Now, Henry has already talked and other speakers have about the complexity. There's no question about it. Dodd-Frank is the most complex piece of legislation I've ever seen. Uh, and it, it, it is only going to get more complex. Regulation became the immediate response to the financial crisis. It's a great effort, but it's too complex. It focuses on regulations to design things that went wrong. It's so complex and heavily lobbied that it won't solve the risks it was intended to. We're simply allowing regulators who missed the boat the first time to try again with even more regulation. Somebody, some wag said that it was as though professors at the business of law school were letting uh, the students mark their own papers, which is ridiculous. And that's what's happening under Dodd-Frank. We're asking this group of regulators to correct what they did wrong in the first place by adding more regulation. I would suggest that we go beyond utopia and we begin thinking about everything through a competition antitrust lens. Well, look at a few examples of what the first problems I would study. I would study concentration and I would study conglomeration. Between 1934 and 86, uh, the number of banks uh, stayed stable at about 14,000. From 86 to 210, the number went down to 6,500 and is constantly decreasing. In 1980, the assets of the five largest banks amounted to 25%, 29% of all banking assets, assets or 14% of the GDP. In 2011, the five, five largest banks held more than 50% of the total assets or 80% of the GDP. The 10 largest banks hold over $7 trillion of assets. Over 6,000 banks hold only the 40 remaining percent. Five banks represent nearly 96% of the notional amount of derivatives, and 25 banks hold 100% of all derivatives. In 2009, the four largest banks originated 58% of all mortgage loans, service 56% of all the loans, and in that same year, the four largest banks controlled 56% of the credit market. Now, I suggest we stop thinking about them as banks. They are giant conglomerates, and breaking them up is not going to be easy, uh, nor is it a simple matter. We have to think about each one of the lines of businesses, what they do, how we deal with them, what are the respective markets, are they concentrated or not, this is big time antitrust. But the point is, this kind of size and concentration is something that antitrust always looked at. Think about it. Think about the numbers I just gave you. This is heavy concentration. We used to know how to break up steel. We used to know how to break up oil. We used to know how to break up railroads. We don't know how to do this anymore because it's not steel, it's not railroads, it's not oil. It's a conglomerate comprised of many, many pieces and I'm not sure myself how I would go about doing it. But we haven't had the antitrust division or the Department of Justice or the FTC involved in this in any way, even though Dodd-Frank said they should be there. Why is it the FTC and the Department of Justice sitting on FSOC? Why aren't they there injecting competition theory into what's being done in this regulation? They're not even there. To the best of my knowledge, they're not even consulted. This, I think, is a terrible mistake. Now, would they're sitting there automatically be in favor of breakup? I don't think so. They're very sophisticated. They would be thinking about markets, and they would begin to think about these conglomerates in terms of their respective markets. And they would begin to think about, how do you deal with this surgically, not with the meat acts? Uh, antitrust enforcement waxes and wanes. 
And I think the era of deregulation is over in antitrust. Uh, and I think, as Professor Herring does, that even a firm with a relatively low market share still warrants antitrust scrutiny. Now, what would this have to do with systemic risk? Well, one of the Federal Trade Commissions has recently said uh, that a merger entity that is too big to fail very well could violate Section 7 of the Clayton Act. If it creates a firm whose failure is likely to have a catastrophic effect on competition, it could definitely be the subject of antitrust. Now, we don't have that merger analysis. It hasn't been performed. And we don't have a basis for even thinking about deconcentration because we're still thinking about them as banks and not conglomerates with multiple, multiple lines of business. For example, is there other, are there other things going on besides merger problems and size and concentration? Yes. Uh, recent public release noted that some of our largest banks seem to be under investigation in the US and Europe and Japan for somehow manipulating the London interbank rate, the Euro interbank rate, and the Tokyo interbank rate. Now, I don't know whether this is necessarily true. It's only a report. But it shows you what might happen with a heavily concentrated industry. Oligopolistic behavior is much easier <coughs> to accomplish if there are only a few people involved. And there are other imaginable vertical issues which could be thought about under the antitrust law, like tying product sales. Is insurance tied to other things that the bank does? Uh, is b mortgage uh, handling uh, tied to other things that the bank does? I, I don't really know. But it's hard for me as an ex-antitrust lawyer, if I was sitting in the government, I would say it's pretty ripe. I would like to take a look at all of this. Do I know it's going to come out wrong? I don't know. But I certainly, my hair would stand on end with the numbers, with the heavily concentrated, with the, what the possibilities are, and I would at least want to study it from a competition issue. Now, if we take all account of everything that I've just said, and if we account for the fact that we have a heavily concentrated industry, what should we be thinking about? First thing I'd be thinking about is, how does the current interconnected nature and large size of banks impact antitrust and competition analysis of future mergers, mergers and conduct? We don't know how to do that yet. Nobody's done it. Uh, in ING Capital, they just did it. They merged again within the last year or two. Nobody seemed to care about that. Why, did, why, why didn't somebody take a good hard look at what was going on? Second thing I'd look at is how does the conglomerate nature of the mega banks impact market analysis? How much future competition is being precluded by the co conglomerates? What's the evidence of efficiencies? Do we really know there are any? Uh, there are, next thing I would look at, there are still many banks, but fewer than before. What ability does a new bank have to compete in any of these markets with regard to products, with regard to all of the products that people offer through the mega banks? Uh, what about another subject I would like to look at is what about the pricing practices of the mega banks? Uh, is there, in fact, uh, in, uh, a possible oligopolistic pricing and coordinated effects policy. These are things we would look at if we were back in the government. Is there tension between traditional antitrust analysis and financial stability? Many think, and Henry mentioned it too, that there may be pro-competitive effects. You gotta take a look at it. Maybe the size is important. Maybe we ought to see what the pro-competitive effects are and weigh them against the anti-competitive effects and see where we wanna wind up. Now, should practices surrounding the vertical activities of the mega banks, mortgage origination, mortgage servicing, consumer lending, are these antitrust problems? I don't know. I'm suspicious, but I don't know. And I think we ought to take a look. Now to wind it up, let me remind you that the Department of Justice has stated from the very beginning that financial products, like many other products, become better understood through experience. Haven't we had the experience of seeing the financial sector change dramatically in the last 10 years? Yes. This isn't your mother's old financial sector. It isn't your old corner bank. This industry has changed dramatically. It's concentrated. It's made up of conglomerates. This was not true 15 or 20 years ago. And as Henry <coughs> says, it's marching down the road. And it's getting more so. Uh, it's time to take a look at where we are, not where we thought we were. 
And it's time for regulators to stop regulating what used to be what they thought and adding more regulations to try to mimic the market. I don't know that you can do that. And I, in any case, it seems to me it's time to take a step back and take stock of what really is, in fact, the financial sector today. <clears throat> what is it? How does it work? Can it ever be restored to comp competition? I don't know. But to bypass that question and just keep on regulating, uh, it seems to me, is going to take us where Henry doesn't want us to go, namely nationalization, possibly. It's just going to be more and more and more regulation until we give up because we can never regulate enough to mimic a market. We can't. It's just not done. Nobody ever did it, and we're not going to be able to do it either. So before we go in that direction, Henry, I would urge us to stop, take a look, and see where we are. That's my story. I'm stuck Ira, with it. <laughs> Ira, thank you so much. That was just a grand presentation. Now, uh, to the dean, Glenn Hubbard. This is not the view, necessarily, of Columbia University. <laughs> my view or Ira's? <laughs> well, first, I'd like to you know, really thank the conference organizers for putting this together, because it's a great program, and this is a, a wonderful panel, and I've, I've known Henry especially for many years, and certainly much of what I know about financial regulation I have learned from him. Uh, I'm going to disagree a little bit with both presentations. You've heard my, my short answer, if you only gave me one word, would be no, um, breaking up the big banks, but I'll, I'll give you a longer version of it. But I really share Henry's uh, concerns about where we're headed in government intervention in credit. And I very much share IRAs with the necessity under the present path of a regulatory cat and mouse game that's unlikely to be uh, very productive. In thinking about large institutions, because my, my business school actually dominates the leadership of a lot of these, I would call them to Columbia to fail. So I'm gonna put them in a separate <laughs> category. Uh, but I do want to spend a few minutes talking with you about the central problem of too big to fail. And I think you, it cannot be uh, overemphasized as the elephant in the room in thinking about regulation and the problematic path we're on now. It's also worth reminding ourselves why we have and should celebrate having an efficient financial system. It is all important plumbing for our economy it serves millions of Americans and creates an obvious role for government to ensure its safety and soundness. And I agree with Henry about what intermediation should do. It should be a business of facilitating entrepreneurship and for providing financial opportunities for saving uh, and investment. In my view, we are on a regulatory path right now that harms growth and fails to improve safety and soundness. And I think that comes about for two reasons. One, as I'll make clear in just a moment, I think current regulation had a poor understanding of the actual causes of the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis, and we had a poorly designed regulatory response uh, in Dodd-Frank. Following what Henry said, I would agree that the act is too big to read. It is very, very large, but it really has very little to do with much of what actually happened in the crisis. Starting with the actual financial problems, uh, economists, of course, are still uh, doing our usual work on, on storytelling about the crisis, but I think it's fair to say that there's an emerging consensus that the crisis was caused by many things, careless and risky behavior by lots of individuals from consumers and bankers and financial institutions and government officials and regulators, all built on a foundation of structural problems both in the world economy and in financial regulation. To the topic at hand for this uh, session, I would start with a simple idea that regulatory reform for banks should be related first to relevant specific factors that figured into the financial crisis, which I'm going to argue had to do with too big to fail, the role of the GSEs, and the lack of transparency in some derivatives trading. And policy generally should be attuned to the relevant general factors, which in this case were large scale saving and investment imbalances that led to very low levels of both world real interest rates and risk premia, 
monetary policy errors and regulatory holes that created a very large shadow banking system. But none of that is what we are doing uh, in Dodd-Frank and with policy generally uh, after the crisis. Now I'll come back to Dodd-Frank and at least what my own version of a replacement for it would be in a bit. But I wanted to begin with a general observation about financial regulatory reform to frame this discussion about the banks. And there are really two narratives here. One that I would take as the apparently prevailing policy narrative, it's certainly the narrative that guided Dodd-Frank, and it goes something like this. Financial firms, particularly the largest and most so-called systemically important, engaged in practices that led to the crisis. And so to avoid this unpleasantness going forward, regulatory powers should be substantially expanded. In this narrative, all we need is a new regulatory structure and more of the same folks on the watch before. Now, I would call this a Victorian story. It reminds me of my mother who always believed that where there was pleasure, pain could not be far behind. <laughs> so in, in this story, banks got out ahead of themselves and what we need is more watchful regulation. And like most Victorian stories or most of my mother's stories, there's always a grain of truth, but it is woefully incomplete. In particular, the government-sponsored enterprises were given not only license, but actually direction to take excessive risks. Their funding backstop was based on being so-called constructively ambiguous, but it was unambiguously not constructive. And these arguments don't imply that we need to take apart big banks if market forces lead to their emergence. A big economy may need big banks, and there's evidence, I know Loretta will be speaking to this, of scale economies in commercial banking, and certainly the high fixed cost of regulation push banking in that direction. Before we can really talk about the who in regulatory reform, the musical chairs game of Dodd-Frank, we really should be talking about the what of effective regulation and supervision, which I'll come back to in a moment, but my three parts have to do with transparency, ending too big to fail, and accountability. Now for something different, what's an alternative narrative that should guide the regulatory debate? I would argue with you that effective regulation and in thinking about our policies toward the biggest institution needs market discipline, not just more of the same regulators. And I would start with the following. No firm, full stop, should be too big to fail. Doesn't matter whether that firm is a commercial firm, an industrial firm, or a financial firm. And a first step in market discipline to making that true would be clearer information for shareholders, for creditors, and regulators. In the current parlance, stress tests definitely play a role, but the Federal Reserve's recent stress tests are certainly not transparent and certainly don't provide clear information to the marketplace. Bank balance sheets and their effective leverage levels are still too opaque. Second, too big to fail as enshrined actually in Dodd-Frank acts as a barrier to effective competition. The subject of innovation has come up already in the panel. Creative destruction, which we look for in industry, can't survive the destructive creation of funding advantages and implicit guarantees for so-called systemically important firms. Third, calls for stronger capital and liquidity buffers need to be complemented with a real means for resolving the failures of complex financial institutions. The reason this is so important has come up in both of the previous presentations. If we cannot convincingly get rid of too big to fail and excessive government intervention in credit markets, we necessarily head to a utility regulation model of large financial institutions. That affects not only the dynamism of those institutions, but of the financial system as a whole. And with regulation generally, as we know in many industries, some institutions wind up earning rents from their preferred status with regulators, and that is not in our economy's interest. Now, I think we're on the wrong path uh, with Dodd-Frank. It doesn't restore trust in our large financial institutions, which remain opaque, and too many of whom are still too big to fail. It didn't even address, despite however many characters and words it had, excessive credit intervention in the housing sector that increased financial vulnerability. Dodd-Frank, in my view, makes another crisis more likely 
because of arbitrary powers that are given to the FDIC and the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and it makes the cycle of bailouts extremely unpopular with both political parties, again, more likely because of the failure to make smart fixes to the bankruptcy code or to have a clearer bail-in structure under the so-called orderly liquidation authority. It also makes the regulatory system more complex, particularly for large financial institutions, with both the CFPB and the FSOC, along with no consolidation, really, of existing regulators. And as Henry pointed out earlier, the net of all of this will act to restrict credit to households and small firms and harms the competitiveness of the U.S. financial sector. Now, we can do better than this. The first step would be to attack too big to fail and accompanying bailouts. And I think this could be done in a couple of ways. The first would be to make uh, changes to longstanding and effective bankruptcy regimes or to put in place bail-ins that would make more effective the orderly liquidation authority and put flesh on the bones of no too big to fail. There's a point that's sometimes obscured uh, in this debate, thinking about it from an economist's perspective. Taxpayer-funded bailouts are actually going to be inevitable uh, in financial panics as long as the social costs of those panics or of those bailouts are perceived to be less than the social costs of any available alternative. In the public's mind, this is about backbone of whoever the Treasury Secretary is or the Fed Chairman or Wall Street influence. I don't really think those are the, the leading factors. Rather, policymakers have to develop a credible alternative to both taxpayer-funded bailouts on the one hand and disorderly liquidations on the others, or in econ speak, policymakers and the market have to be confident that this new action, this new regime, this no too big to fail regime will actually result in a lower social cost than a bailout on the one hand or a fire sale on the other. Now, I'm not terribly optimistic that ex ante solutions work here. I mean, two that are emphasized in the current debate are massively higher capital on banks. I'm skeptical there of that being a problem solver simply because it doesn't address at all the rise of shadow banks. And I'm also not convinced that small banks, as opposed to larger, a solution to the problem for two reasons. The bank failures in the 1930s were massive waves of failures of unit banks as well as large banks. And as long as, as risks are correlated in lending activities, the mere existence with a large number of small banks doesn't get you out of the box. Rather, I think what you need are more wise uh, ex post remedies. And again, just to put flesh on two, it strikes me the place to start is with the bankruptcy code. We know that bankruptcy does offer some advantages in terms of transparency, in terms of due process safeguards for creditors and stakeholders. The problem, of course, in a financial institution is can it move with uh, great speed? One idea here is the work that's being done uh, on so-called Chapter 14 reform that would grant an institution's primary regulator standing to be heard and would allow DIP or debtor in possession financing, including by government, to be provided to liquidity uh, sensitive creditors. There's still a remaining concern, at least in my view, in this world about speed and about whether judges appointed to this new kind of bankruptcy court will be better able than traditional bankruptcy judges to deal with it. Another problem or another option to my mind that deserves very serious comparison is work on bail-ins within the orderly liquidation authority structure of Dodd-Frank. So that would be recapitalization plans within resolution that could lower social costs and build credibility. I think an advantage of that structure is that it may be even easier in terms of cross-border uh, cooperation. I think regulators could make a case that a well-run recapitalization would produce more value for creditors, not only at home but abroad, than fire sale liquidations around the world after local ring fencing. After we deal with too big to fail, a second issue is to focus in large banks on the core problem of too much leverage and to inform regulators about how to understand when leverage risk levels uh, are too high. 
part of that, again, in my view, would be measuring and dealing with, by regulation, shadow banking as well. The third piece would be to reform regulation by having a more simple and a more accountable regulatory structure, while at the same time uh, removing the distorting government intervention from the housing market. Now, I say all of this because I go back to where I began. I think the financial system has a vital role to play in the economy for growth and jobs. Nothing I have seen, at least as an economist, suggests that there's something inherently superior about wiping out big banks in achieving that goal. At the same time, though, both financial institutions and regulators need to align risk and reward. We need to make sure that those who seek profits aren't doing so by imposing losses on tax holders, taxpayers. And financial institutions, including the very biggest ones, and the financial system as a whole, need to be made sound and robust. And to my mind, again, that starts with ending too big to fail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Now, Loretta Messer. So thank you very much. Um, first, I really want to thank Ira and uh, Charlie Calamiris and the Richmond Center for inviting me to speak. I think it's been a very interesting discussion for me, uh, and uh, hopefully you agree. Before I start, I just want to remind people I'm speaking for myself and not the Federal Reserve, or Columbia University, for that matter. <laughs> okay. So breaking up the banks has been suggested as a solution to institutions being viewed as too big to fail, and as we've been discussing, too big to fail is an insidious problem because it undermines the ability of private sector investors to provide market discipline. Indeed, too big to fail has been um, a struggle for uh, regulators since the failure of Continental Illinois in 1984, and the research suggests that once market discipline is undermined, it also takes quite a long time um, to reestablish it. So the basic problem we all know is when creditors believe the government is not going to allow an institution to fail and that they'll be fully protected, their ex ante incentive to monitor the firm's risk taking is undermined. And to the extent that trouble at one institution uh, you know, spills over to other institutions um, and the potential to create a systemic event, um, the institution's risk taking imposes an externality. Um, but left to their own devices, the firms have no um, incentive to internalize the impact of their risk taking on the likelihood of a systemic event. So that suggests that there's a role for government um, intervention or government policy, but the recent financial crisis has underscored that the pre-crisis bank supervisory apparatus was not adequate to solve the problem. So it's very natural, you know, if some banks are too big to fail, it seems reasonable to ask whether breaking them up is a solution to the problem. And that's what this session um, has posed as the question for us to, to talk about today. My answer to the question is um, no. Okay, and for two reasons. First, I'm very skeptical that such an approach can adequately address the concerns that the policy is intended to solve. And second, the approach ignores the cost that would be associated with breaking up the banks. So it seems to me that to evaluate such a potential solution, we have to know why the banks have gotten so large in the first place. Um, the research um, has suggests that some institutions have grown in size not to gain the system, but for reasons of efficiency. So now it's still possible, of course, that systemic risk posed by large complex institutions might outweigh the, in the efficiencies gained by scale, and that's what Dick talked about this morning. But without estimating the risk and these efficiencies, it's really impossible to compare the costs and benefits. Moreover, the effectiveness of size limits depends on knowing the market pressures on banks to become big that encourage growth. Effective regulation needs to work with market forces, not against them. So rather than breaking up the banks, I believe there are better strategies for addressing too big to fail that focus on the externalities created by systemically important financial institutions, which we, we call SIFIs. In particular, I believe a more effective approach to too big to fail would be to institute a credible and less discretionary resolution method for SIFIs, and we've talked about that today already. A couple of the panelists have, have proposed this. And also to impose higher costs on firms that impose more systemic risk on the financial system. So in your booklet, I have a paper, and the figures in, those pa in, in that booklet show some of the data. Um, and Ira pointed out some of these statistics as well. 
Um, the past 30 years, we've seen a striking amount of consolidation in the industry, both in the U.S. and abroad. It's not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's happening in countries um, across the globe. In the U.S., the number of commercial banks have fallen from about 14,500 in 1984 to fewer than 7,000 today. And banks have gone very large in size over time, and the industry has become more concentrated. Since 1984, there's been a, almost a seven-fold increase in mean consolidated real assets and almost a three-fold increase in median consolidated real assets. I mean, and as Ira pointed out, the top five bank holding companies hold 50% of industry assets today compared to 20% in 1984. And there's been a strong shift in the distribution towards larger institutions. Complexity, of course, is also an issue. Uh, an issue. If you look at, on the web, the organizational hierarchy of Bank of America, it takes 161 pages to list. <laughs> the 15 institutions identified by Bank of England and the IMF as large, complex financial institutions, on average, operate in 44 countries and have over 1,000 subsidiaries. But size and complexity, no doubt, are likely correlated with systemic risk but they're not, they need not be the only criteria. Some institutions are small in size, but very interconnected. And systemic importance can be related to how important the institution is in a particular market, interconnections with other CIFIs, and the extent to which the firm's interconnectedness is not transparent. So when an institution of any size becomes distressed, there can be contagion to other institutions. If the creditors conclude that the firms are sufficiently similar in terms of the assets they hold or in terms of their business strategy. Um, and we talked earlier today about Northern Rock. I mean, I think that's an example because that was a medium-sized firm. Um, it, it concentrated in residential mortgages, but it did cause financial instability in Britain as investors became concerned uh, about the real estate assets on the books of other banks. So financial instability can result if firms take on correlated risk even if no firm is too big to fail or is, is big, okay? And this suggests that size is not the only thing we need to focus on. So I, I'm a little bit worried that the proposed remedies of too big to fail that focus only on size and advocate breaking up the banks are likely going to miss important issues and give a false sense of security. Imagine a line of defense is what some people have called it, and I tend to agree. Another problem with the break up the banks policy is that it fails to recognize that there are significant scale economies in banking. Size confers efficiency. So many people continue to cite older research that used data from the 80s um, and didn't find these economies. But the more recent research using data from the 1990s and 2000 finds significant scale economies at banks of all sizes. So again, in your booklet table two in my paper, give some estimates of scale economies from a recent research paper I wrote with some co-authors, uh, co-author uh, Joe Hughes. And our sample includes 842 top-tier bank holding companies in the U.S. in 2007. They range in size from 72 million up to 2.2 trillion in assets. The model we estimate takes into account bank managers' decisions about risk-taking and isolates the scale economies due to better diversification of liquidity credit risk, technological progress, and other scale advantages. In that paper, we find significant economies of scale at all sizes of banks in the sample, including those with assets over $50 billion, which are now subject to stricter prudential standards. Our results indicate that breaking up the largest financial institutions would significantly increase the cost of producing the current set of financial products. And we provide additional results that show that these scale economies are driven by bank production technology and not by too big to fail considerations. So let me emphasize that I, well, I'm not saying that too big to fail banks do not enjoy a funding advantage, only that the model controls for these funding advantages and still uncovers scale economies. Nor do our results imply that all bank mergers are value enhancing. In another paper, paper, we show that corporate governance matters. We find that banks with good corporate governance, growth is associated with improved performance, but at banks with entrenched management, growth by acquisition is associated with worse performance. I also want to note that while larger scale means lower cost per unit of risk, a scale economy, 
It also means that banks have the capacity to take on more risk. Risk is endogenous. A larger, better diversified institution faces a better risk expected return frontier or trade-off, but it might choose a higher level of risk on that frontier than a smaller bank. Thus, scale economies need not mean that the ins a larger institution is less risky than a smaller institution. But the results suggest that in the cost-benefit analysis of break up the banks, one needs to consider the cost of loss efficiency were such a size restriction imposed. And to the extent that economic considerations drive size and a financial firm's choice of activities, strict size and activity limits pr would prevent the economy from realizing the benefits of growth and diversification. Also in the US, if the US were to impose such a restriction, while other countries did not, it might have competitive implications as well. These costs must be weighed against the benefits that might arise from limiting size. I agree wholeheartedly with Ira that we must ensure that antitrust guidelines are adequately maintained and to help prevent large bank holding companies from exercising market power. The existence of scale economies also suggests that even if one wants to pursue a policy of, of limiting uh, bank size, those limits would be difficult to sustain. The limits would work against market forces and would not alleviate the spillovers and the incentives of risk taking, which are at the heart of the too big to fail problem in the first place. Indeed, if scale economies are large, size restrictions would create uh, great incentives for firms to try to evade the restrictions by moving activities outside of the more regulated part of, this, of the financial system without necessarily reducing systemic risk. The risk would migrate elsewhere, but it wouldn't be minimized or eliminated. And I think one lesson of the crisis is that we should avoid policies that would mere, merely push risk-taking risk outside of the regulated financial sector where it's more difficult to monitor. So this uh, discussion suggests that any remedy to the too big to fail problem needs to address first the incentives for institutions to take on risk that is excessive from society's viewpoint. Um, and their incentive to create spillovers to other institutions. And second, the incentives for regulators to bail out institutions to get into trouble because they fear that imposing losses on creditors will create a systemic event. Regarding the incentives of institutions, since too big to fail is an externality, regulators need to get institutions to internalize some of the costs of taking on excessive risk by pricing it or else by imposing quantity restrictions. Now, of course, one can interpret the, the uh, limit on bank size as a quantity restriction, but it's a very blunt one, and it isn't targeted at activities that increase systemic risk. So my preference would be to use pricing so that firms can reduce risk in an efficient way. So institutions that raise the probability of <coughs> systemic problems when they are under distress should be charged a higher price, which would provide incentives to reduce their systemic importance. To the extent that larger institutions are thought to create more systemic problems, they would face a surcharge. This could be in terms of insurance premia, supervisory oversight, and or higher capital requirements, as we talked about this morning. But size would not be the only metric for determining systemic risk. Now, such surcharges have potential, but admittedly, they're going to be hard to calibrate unless we estimate the value of the implicit government support of being too big to fail. Indeed, to answer the question, at what size or in what type of organizational form of potentially too big to fail institutions do the externalities imposed on the financial system outweigh the scale economies conferred by that size or, or organizational form? We really need to be able to measure systemic risk, the scale efficiencies, and the value of government guarantees, both explicit and implicit. In order to monitor systemic risk, uh, we need to be able to measure it, um, yet developing metrics is, is at a very early stage, and Mark talked about some of that um, this morning. Um, so one, one thing that we really do need, and, and someone who's, as someone who's worked in the, in the area, we really need better microdata on banks, and also on the non-bank firms um, that are part of the financial system. Um, we're going to have to be able to measure an institution's contribution to systemic risk um, and then price that contribution so that the institution internalizes the externality. Um, I think one positive development is recognition that we do need to increase our data uh, 
uh, capability in this area. Other policies could help as well. For example, the contingent capital that we spoke about this morning uh, can lower the probability of spillovers um, by giving institutions a way to raise capital in circumstances when it's typically difficult to do so. Contingent capital can lo lower the probability of failure and limit the loss given default. Um, and this gives the, way, the regulators a way to restructure the firm with capital that's already available in the firm's balance sheet. Now, regarding the incentives of regulators to close banks, what we need is a credible way to resolve the failures of CIFIs, um, especially those that operate across uh, countries. And we talked about this this morning as well, and on the panel, um, Glenn, Glenn talked about this problem. The recent financial crisis has underscored that in the face of serious distress at large um, financial firms, governments could either rescue the firm and create future moral hazard problems or allow the firm to fail at the risk that it would cause a cascade of other failures. Policymakers face this classic dynamic inconsistency problem, and it was clear that a third option was needed. We needed a credible resolution mechanism that would lower the chance of spillovers and impose losses on creditors as well as equity holders in a consistent manner so that everyone would expect this ex ante and know what the rules were. Um, now, the Dodd-Frank does provide that orderly liquidation regime, regime for CIFIs, um, but it allows for a lot of discretion on the part of regulators, and, and to me, that poses a problem. I think the work of Jackson and Skeel makes a fairly compelling case that modified bankruptcy can work even for CIFIs, and then it might work better than application of the FDIC resolution that works well for small banks. Um, and, of course, we would have to work toward harmonizing our laws with those of foreign countries, but as Dick Herring pointed out, maybe we start bilaterally by working with the UK, um, where a lot of the interconnections uh, with our banks exist. Credibility is increased by making the resolution method and the resolution plans less discretionary, rule-based, and transparent. So I think this is open for further work. Um, we, we can get there, I think. Um, let me conclude with a quote from James Madison. He was quoted this morning, so I feel in good company. This is uh, from Barth, Caprio, and Levine. I'm, I'll take credit for this. It's in their book on bank regulation. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Loretta. And I want to thank all the members of the panel. Wonderful. Thank you.